As native peoples were pushed off the land, white American settlers poured in, as I've said. In addition to agriculture and to the extraction of natural resources like timber or like precious metals, two major industries combined to dominate the new Western economy, railroads and ranching. The national rail network that had been created by the building of the transcontinental railroad tracks in the 1860s produced fabled cattle drives across the Central Plains in the 1870s. Railroads allowed live cattle to be shipped to eastern cities where they could be slaughtered. And that created a huge market for western ranches. But railroads had yet to reach Texas. So ranchers began driving cattle northward out of Texas to major railheads in places like Kansas, Missouri, and Nebraska. Ranchers first used well-known trails such as the Chisholm Trail for their drives, but conflicts arose with not only Native Americans in the Indian Territory, but also with farmers in Kansas who disliked the intrusion of destructive herds into their own hunting and ranching and farming lands. Other trails, such as the Western Trail, the Goodnight Loving Trail, and the Shawnee Trail were subsequently blazed as well. Cattle drives were very difficult work for the crews of men who managed the herds. Historians estimate that the number of men who worked as cowboys in the late 19th century were between 12,000 and about 40,000. Probably a quarter of them were African American, and more were likely Mexican or Mexican American. Many of the customs and the techniques of American cowboys were borrowed from the Mexican vaqueros, who also gave the name buckaroo to American cowboys. Cowboys adopted Mexican practices and gear and other Spanish terms, such as rodeo and bronco and lasso. While most cattle drivers were men, there were at least 16 verified accounts of women participating in drives. Some, like Molly Dyer Goodnight, accompanied their husbands. Others, like Lizzie Johnson Williams, helped to drive their own herds. Williams, who lived from 1840 to 1924, was a businesswoman, an author, a teacher, and she was known as the Cattle Queen of Texas. She made at least three known trips with her herds up the Chisholm Trail. Like the prospectors who had flocked to each new gold or silver rush, a lot of cowboys hoped one day to become ranch owners themselves but employment was insecure and wages were low. Beginners could expect to earn around $20 to $25 per month. And even those with years of experience were only getting $40 to $45. Trail bosses got about $50 a month, but it was very, very tough work. On a cattle drive, cowboys worked long hours and faced extremes of both heat and cold and intense blowing dust and they subsisted on limited diets with very irregular supplies. But if workers on cattle drives earned very low wages, ranch owners and investors got huge return. At the end of the Civil War, a steer worth $4 in Texas would fetch $40 at the railhead in Kansas. And yet, by the 1880s, the great cattle drives were largely done. Railroads had created them, and railroads ended them. Branch lines were pushed into Texas and made the cattle drives obsolete. But ranching still brought profits, and the plains were much better suited for grazing than for agriculture. So Western ranchers continued supplying beef for national markets. The American West, or the Wild West, conjures visions of teepees and cabins and cowboys and Indians and farm wives and sunbonnets and outlaws with six shooters. These images pervade American culture. And they're actually as old as the West itself. As soon as settlers and prospectors and cowboys began arriving on the scene, novels and rodeos and Wild West shows sprang up to mythologize the American West throughout the post-Civil War era. Americans devoured dime novels that embellished on the stories of real-life individuals, such as Calamity Jane and Billy the Kid. Owen Wister's novels, especially the Virginian, established the character of the cowboy in popular culture as a gritty, quiet, stoic with a rough exterior, but a heart of gold and the courage and the skills needed to rescue less heroic people from train robbers and Indians and cattle rustlers. 
Such images were reinforced when the rodeo added to popular ideas of the American West as a place of action and of conflict. Rodeos began as small roping and riding contests among cowboys in towns near the ranches or at the camps at the end of the cattle trails. Casual contests evolved into planned celebrations, often scheduled around national holidays, such as the 4th of July. They gained popularity and soon dedicated rodeo circuits developed. Although about 90% of the rodeo contestants were men, women did help popularize rodeo. Popular female bronc riders like Bertha Kaepernick entered men's events until around 1916. Americans also experienced the mythical Wild West at traveling shows that toured the Eastern United States and even across into Europe and Great Britain from the 1880s to the 1910s. Former Army Scout and Bison Hunter William Frederick Buffalo Bill Cody was among the first to recognize the broad national appeal of the stock characters of the American West, cowboys, Indians, sharpshooters, cavalrymen, and rangers, and to put them all together into a massive traveling extravaganza. Cody himself disliked the word show. He was afraid that it implied an exaggeration or a misrepresentation of the West. He instead called his production, which he launched in 1883, simply Buffalo Bill's Wild West. He employed real cowboys and Indians, such as Wild Bill Hickok, and even Sitting Bull worked for Buffalo Bill's Wild West between the time of his surrender and the time of his murder. But it was still entertainment, and wasn't that different in its broad outlines from contemporary theater. Storylines depicted Western migration, life on the plains, Indian attacks, all broken up by cowboy fun, like bucking broncos and roping cattle and sharpshooting events. In an attempt to appeal to women, Cody recruited Annie Oakley, a female sharpshooter who thrilled audiences by shooting apples off her poodle's head and shooting the ash off her husband's cigar. May Manning Lilly, the wife of a competing empresario named Gordon Lilly, also became a skilled shot and performed as the world's greatest lady horseback shot. Female sharpshooters were Wild West show staples. As many as 80 toured the country at the peak of the show's popularity. While such acts challenged the expected Victorian gender roles, the female performers were very careful to maintain their feminine identities by riding side saddle and wearing full skirts with corsets during their acts. The Western cowboys and Indians mystique, which was perpetuated in these novels and rodeos and Wild West shows, was rooted in a romantic nostalgia for a frontier era that most people saw as ending. In 1893, Wisconsin historian Frederick Jackson Turner had presented his frontier thesis, one of the most influential theories in American history, in a speech at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. Turner invited his audience to, in his words, stand at the Cumberland Gap and watch the procession of civilization marching single file, the buffalo following the trail to the salt springs, the Indian, the fur trader, the hunter, the cattle raiser, the pioneer farmer, and the frontier has passed by. The frontier stripped away the veneer of old European civilization, Turner said, forcing Americans to build a new civilization out of the frontier and to learn new rules. This new American character of freedom and self-reliance gave the United States its exceptional hustle and its democratic spirit, and it distinguished North America, Turner said, from the stale monarchies of Europe. But Turner also worried about the future. The Census Bureau had declared the frontier closed in 1890. With no dividing line between civilization and savagery, what would become of the nation without the safety valve of the frontier? It was a common sentiment. Theodore Roosevelt wrote to Turner, saying that his essay put into shape a good deal of thought that has been floating around rather loosely. At the time, Roosevelt was a wealthy New Yorker interested in politics. But he shared Turner's concern over the loss of the frontier. Roosevelt was also worried about the late 19th century's new soft industrial world of factory and office work. The mythical cowboy's aggressive masculinity was the seemingly perfect antidote for the middle and upper class city dwelling Americans who feared that they had become over civilized and longed for what Roosevelt called 
the strenuous life. The romance of the West would continue to pull at generations of Americans and would influence their ideas about the U.S. and about its role in world affairs. And we will continue to pursue that theme as we move forward. But that's all for now. So here are a couple of final questions. First, how was the life of the actual cowboy similar to that of the 49er during the gold rush? Second, why were the Wild West shows so popular? Third, why was Frederick Jackson Turner concerned that the frontier had been declared closed? And finally, what effect did frontier life have in shaping Americans, in Turner's opinion?